Okay, thanks for coming. I know it's not already on site, but uh, you do it with it. With it on site now, it's 48 degrees. It was supposed to have 56 degrees, but yes, okay, even more it's going to be 62 anyway. So as you can see, that is, I'm a meteorologist, <laughs> so I'm not uh, an expert on the GIS, but I play one in the classroom. <laughs> so I told the class, uh, GIS class uh, last semester, and this basically is my reflections, my summaries, my experience, and maybe I would like to share with you guys. So this is what I put, like to do. But first is the uh, UNC A each year is part of the 17 campuses of the UNC system. We became part of the system since 1969, but we are in the beautiful western North Carolina, very close to Warren Wilson College. I'm sure their campus is much beautiful than ours, but it's okay. Uh, we have been there since 1927, so two years ago we celebrated our 27, uh, I mean 70th anniversary. And we are in the Bullish Mountains. That is a picture from the Mount Winter. And you can also like to visit the uh, HDN North Carolina, the beautiful town. We have the Bullish Parkway next by. We also have the uh, beautiful house, the largest castle in the United States, and also the HDN, the Bear City. So you can have that kind of the breweries in the HDN neighborhood. And the nightlife is very active and vibrant, much better than. We can sell it downtown. So if you go to downtown HP at night, you get crazy with that. <laughs> so UNCA Department of Meteorology is called actually it's called the Department of Atmosphere Sciences. And but we are the meteorological department and we educate the students to become professional meteorologists working in the private sectors or the government or academia. And we do have instrument how instrumentation powers, we also have a nice facilities and a few experiments. And surprisingly enough, though, I just saw this guy on TV last night. And he graduated from our department in 1989, and his name is Gary Stevenson, and chief judge of the Spectrum News. I saw that last night, and I said, where, where that? But he's the one who does not need to have GIS education. He's doing very well already on TV. But why do we judge the students need to learn GIS? Because it's everywhere. Everybody is using GIS, governments, the new city, city uh, governments, federal governments, NOAA, NASA, they all use GIS. It is, it's excellent of professionalism. It's also showing that it's, it's very remarkable. I mean, not remarkable, yes, remarkable, but also very profitable. And also, it's a very powerful tool for visualization of the data because we, I love maps, we all use maps, even though I watch weather maps all the time. But I always like to see the geographic maps, I like to see the symbolized maps, everything like that. However, there's a lot of challenges because CIS is very powerful, it's also very complex, and you have to access the data, but the quality of the data cannot be as sure. Sometimes you have to double check the data source, and also you require a little bit about programming, such as Python, and also you may be required students to take extra courses, which are additional you know, requirements that they may not be able to graduate in the, you know, four years or less. So, what I'm going to talk about that today is that is, I taught this class, GIS 325, uh, GIS applications in technology last semester. The idea is that is, okay, I want students to have the tool of RGIS that they can go out and do undergraduate research, and that's the whole idea. And this is my syllabus, and I have four pages, but actually I can't read all those you know, black and white type of word processing documents, it looks very boring to me. So I decided to use the PowerPoint, not PowerPoint, but the whatever it's called, the publisher, to come up with a syllabus. Just regular stuff, you know, the lab exercises, the assignments, the homework projects, new presentations, you name it. And then this is the special I have, and it's very tight and it's very, you know, precise in a way because there are so much to teach with so little time. And of course, there's other things you don't need to know, such as if you cheat, you would be a failing, so that's not a big deal for you guys. <laughs> now, everybody knows that. So basically, I like to teach them the basic functions of the GIS, but you can see that you'll know this, so I will give you the head up, I mean, the tip my head off, because you guys are very good. I mean, I listen to your presentations, I say, move away. I said, how could you guys do this? I really cannot do this, but it, it was very eye-opening for me. 
So anyway, if you look at this, the other functions that you will know that yeah, those are the basic things you need to know. Input x, y data, joining, the symbology, overlapping, projections, and you name it, editing tables, operational um, or raster calculators, spatial analysis, you name it, they're all there. And so, but, but that's the technical aspects. The knowledge aspect though is I want them to get the data. Just like the free of the Dr. Everett, they said that the KPN data is a 90% of effort. That's very right. And then you have to have the understanding, uh, understanding of the quality of the data, and then you do a data analysis assessment, and then correlation, come up with the insightful idea and the conclusions about your observations, and then you have to read the literature, and also you are going to give the oral presentations, and uh, also maybe post presentation. So, these are the examples of the lab exercises I uh, asked the students to do. And I just show you that a few things. This is the input, input XY data. Uh, in other words, we can uh, locate the stations, the, the service stations, and also operator stations, with, uh, proper radar stations in the United States. And just basically, you input the X data, data into the RGIS. And the same with projections, uh, the kinds of projections they can use. So they need to know which projection they should use. And also they need to know how to join and how to do the classifications, that's an example. And also do the symbology for the whole world in terms of complex emission. And also they need to know about the layout view. They learn the layout view very quickly, but that is something I really don't want to do. So usually after two or three weeks that they really can get into the layout view. And then also they can edit the attribute tables and then they are going to do contouring. We like contouring because we can, as a meteorologist, uh, we always analyze the maps. We always draw the contours, and that's what we call analysis. And also, we do a little bit of coding, try to uh, match the addresses of the female Democratic uh, voters in Funga County and to see where they are distributed. And also, a little bit of the geo referencing, try to uh, do a lot of coordinating the red points from the uh, static image to the Geomimist uh, layout. We also do the selection and symbology, such as trying to identify the hurricane's impact to North Carolina in nine different kind of decades. And also, we do the modeling. We try to know the people impact by the two hurricanes. One is the Michael, one is Katrina in 2005. So they just come up with one basic simple model, and then they just run it through the different cyclone, the different hurricanes. So. The data resources that the data we use, well, not all of that, but these are the list of data I found out very useful, such as World Bank data, International Monetary Fund, the USDGEIA, and the International Energy Agency. And in terms of climate and weather data, then you can do, you get the global tropical cyclone data from NCEI, National Centers for Environmental Information, and the storm prediction center will give you the storm data since 1950s, tornadoes, chaos, and storm winds reports an IPCC climate model forecast data, draw monitor, snow and ice data center, and of course NCSU library has been very useful, and also NASA data, there are lots of open source GIS data, and overwhelming for all the students, including myself. So, what did I do with undergrad research project? And there are several ones that I would like to do and have done in the global economy, come to as a mission of the nations, and also recognize the climate change vulnerability index and the energy production, consumption, tropical cycle statistics. Am I going too fast? Oh, let's keep on going then. <laughs> okay, so we talk about mapping of US droughts and iceberg distribution, NDVI, rainbow benefit in West North Carolina, of course, climate change in the South. Oh, my God, say, I forgot that there's a button. Can you hear me? Yeah. But anyway, I don't like my voice. <laughs> well, should I repeat from the beginning? <laughs> but I think this is the worst experience. You are not here. That's all your fault. You are not here. You are not here to check me out. And how do I know I have to press the button? I'm not a robot. I don't, I don't need to press my button to, to, to work. OK. I pressed your button. You're fine. You did. You did. Now I'm very excited. But, uh, but what should I do with the, last, uh, the first half then? 
I feel so bad because people were looking forward to it. But anyway, what I've done is like an equal impact of climate change. I'm going to go and talk, talk about everything about this because it will be like 20 minutes long again. But you all know that carbon dioxide increase and rapid rate warming in the last 30 years. So this shows the, the annual carbon dioxide emission of the world since 1960 all the way to 2014. But there are two things stand up very quickly. That is China and the United States. They emit most carbon dioxide emission, especially China right now is the largest carbon dioxide emission of the whole world. And then I use IMF data to classify there are four groups in the, United States, in, the, in the whole world, high income, upper middle income, low middle income, low income. I know it's confusing. Just think about that is we are high income countries and the upper middle income is China and India is a lower middle income and Pakistan, African stand up uh, uh, and also the African countries, they are the low income countries. So what did you see then? Always people talk about the impact of climate change, but one thing to tell you that is, if you look at this, the charts to show the GDP per person versus energy use per person, then you recognize that is, we do have the growth of GDP with a lot less and fewer energy use per person. Look at that from the 19, let's say, or maybe 19, uh, 2000 or 1990, which is going down. So we become more efficient in producing the economic growth, but also without using so much energy. But what's the problem then? Well, the problem is for China, because you can see that is they still have a growth of GDP, but use more and more energy in order to produce the GDP. So efficiency is not really there. So there's something we need to be concerned. But also, which countries are more vulnerable then? Well, of course, we have to know that African countries but they are not responsible for all the mass we produced by injecting the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Another poster I did is to show the climate change in the North Carolina and South Carolina, but then actually they don't really change that much. If you look at the temperatures and the precipitation, they are almost similar, but you don't see any year. It's more rainfall or less, so, but we do have a drought in here and there, but that's part of the poster there. But this is a severe weather event since 1950 to 2016, but you could see the hurricanes, of course, making impacts to the eastern North Carolina and also South Carolina. And where you have tornadoes then, well, most likely will be in the eastern North Carolina in the central Piedmont and also the central North South Carolina. But interesting enough though, we do have more wind damages over the western North Carolina and also together with the, the wind damage here and also a bit of hail producing in the western North Carolina and the upstate of South Carolina. And I also did a little bit thing here, it's called uh, finding out uh, landfall typhoons in Taiwan. That's where I came from, and that's the 18 tracks of the typhoons since 2007 to 2016. And you recognize that is the central mountains in the middle of the Taiwan, and that plays a very important role in terms of precipitation rainfall patterns, and that is the tracks, and this is another track into the middle of Taiwan, and you recognize that on the windward side of this central mountain range, it has more rain, and also northern, actually the western, I should say, is the right side of the tracks has more precipitation than the south side, which is on the other side of the hurricane path. And now these are the two undergraduate student education, I mean, research. <laughs> I, I go too fast. I still have seven minutes. So this is the two uh, students uh, did in my class. And one is he was interested in iceberg distribution. So he come up with uh, collect the data as a distribution of the iceberg in basically in, in the North Atlantic uh, near the Labrador. And they, it's a huge data set, so he has to write a Python language program to sort it out and put into the Excel, then it put that into the ArcGIS. So this is what it shows. I know it's pretty messy because it's for the whole year, 2008. So basically the iceberg will be coming southward and along the Labrador and, uh, and then crossing into the channel or something like this. He also did a track analysis for one specific iceberg, and you can see that how it's moving along and then stuck in the summer bay and then going nowhere and dissipating. And so, he also interested in that is that it's called the North Atlantic Oscillation to see the positive phase and negative phase and then to see if any pattern differences. And of course, as you guessed that, there's no any significant uh, relationship or differences or similarities between these two. So it's really hard to say that is which uh, positive phase of the NAO will cause more iceberg drifting farther southward or vice versa. It's really hard to make that kind of definitions. 
But again, you'll know that research is just the beginning of the future research. So he was doing this, and he would like to go to graduate school to continue to work on this iceberg uh, research. Another thing they did is the group project of the four students. And they would like to know is that is any correlation between the greenness based on the NDVI data and the pop-up thunderstorm, which means just the thunderstorm producing the heavy precipitation over Western North Carolina to see if there's any relationship between the two. And interesting enough, though, they thought is if more greenness, then there will be more pop-up thunderstorm. <laughs> that seems to be opposite to what I thought. I thought that, wait a minute, you may have more pop out thunderstorms, more heavy precipitation, then you may have more greenness, more trees, more leaves, and that kind of stuff. But that's why I been keep on thinking about that throughout the semester, but then to the end, he told me that, they told me that, no, 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 it's the opposite of that. I said, what, what the heck? Are you guys, what are you doing? You've been doing this all semester, and I did not know what you guys are doing, but that's fun, because that is how important it is when they are, go out and do the research. So they did choose the about 13, 14 stations across the three counties, the Buncan County and Hayward County and Transylvania County. And then they collect the two-year annual, uh, two-year daily precipitation data and try to sort them out and to see which day has a pop of thunderstorms. In other words, the criteria they use is if on that day they have more rainfall, say one inch or so, that more likely is due to the thunderstorms, not due to the stratus form clouds, due to the consistent, persistent precipitations. So that is what they thought. And so they come up with a conclusion that is a very important chart shows that is, seems like the interesting pop up thunderstorm occur more in Hayward County and the Transylvania County, but not so much in Buncan County. So this dots representing the blue dots represents the total rainfall, and the red dot represents the pop up rainfall. And so you could see very quickly the percentage-wise about the percentage of thunderstorm versus the total rainfall for those 13, 14 stations. And that something to do with elevation, something to do with the geography, but I really don't know, and we did not really have time to do that. After all, it's just one semester. So what would be my reflections then? I'm sorry I took the class. I, I, I taught the class because it's so time consuming because I was not really good at the GIS. So I had to study the preparations since the beginning, actually like a year ago, try to come up with uh, reading the paper and books and then doing the ArcGIS exercises and myself to make sure I can assign those labs to the students. So it's very, very labor intensive. So. I did learn a lot. I'm sure the student has learned a lot too, but again, the conclusion is that is GIS is very powerful and complex. We do have a license at UNC Asheville to use ArcGIS, ESRI, all the package, and so every student can access that. They also can download and install that the ArcGIS on their personal computers, so they really can do anything they want to. I know it's pretty expensive to have that license. And also, I think it's very important, even though it's a three credit hour lecture type class, but I think lab segments are very important. So we, I put the time there to give them the lab assignments so they can work together with lecture. And I also noticed that is Microsoft Excel uh, experience is very important too. So I think we need to integrate both Microsoft Excel and ArcGIS in teaching undergrad research. So my summary is very simple, okay? I, it's a good experience for the students. That's what they said in their evaluation, but also it's my good experience with the RGIS. Push me off the edge, try to learn something new because I'm really a good meteorologist, but not a very good with the GIS, but really love to learn something new. And I would hope to incorporate Microsoft Excel and RGIS in the future more, but additional training myself and also for the students would be Python programming and maybe some statistics. And I also think that is two courses sequence would be much better to teach the students because I thought the first idea is that, well, the first the class maybe teaching the basics and second class maybe teaching the really doing the serious research. But I only have one class to teach, so that is not doable. So I have to cram all the materials and all the expectations together into one semester long course. And I would like to collect more applicable data and also redesign the lab exercises. So I think that uh, will be my wishful thinking. So I think I'm done. And thank you for your patience. And thank you for listening. And I'm sure you all have a very good day. And have a nice weekend. <laughs>
Yes, you have to speak louder. My ears, your hearing is not that great. Using R? Yeah, in conjunction with the RGIS? Well, I, I, I don't know anything about R, but the impression I have that is R is very good for image processing. Yeah. It's not true? It is primarily a statistical analysis. Yeah, it's a statistical analysis with the images. That's why, no, it's not? It's everything. Okay, it's everything. But, well, I'm the old dog, so don't ask me to learn the new tricks, okay? <laughs> I would like to be lying on the floor and thinking about retirement. Give me a break. I mean, <laughs> Can you guess that how long I, I how, can you guess how long I've been teaching at UNC Asheville? A long time, right? How long? Give me a number: 20, 30, 40? 30 years. Very good. Yeah, 35 years. So I'm still enjoying doing it a lot. Another trick question is: How many students were in that class? 15. Huh? 15 students. No. No. How many? You say four? <laughs> you are very observing because if you look at the names of those students' lab exercises, the names keep on popping up. No, it's better than four, it's five. <laughs> but you are very good. The thing is that is we, UNC Asheville is a very small public liberal arts university, university, so our regular class size is 19, and this is elective. So all the requirements for our majors are very extremely high. It goes from calculus one all the way to differential equations, plus calculus physics one, physics two, and then meteorological courses, the humanity requirements, everything. So to have an elective offered to them, they sometimes don't have a time to do it. So I think it's very small. I know I was shocked. I said, wait a minute, only five students? I mean, okay, fine, I still got my paycheck anyway, so thanks God. So not counting the student numbers, but rather getting the pay as I usually get, so yes? What, meteor what meteorological scale would you say benefits most from GIS? Like meteorological scale? Well, it depends on your research purpose and studies then. But if you are thinking about methods, you're thinking about more like thunderstorm things, but tornado statistics. But for my case, that I would like to know is more like an equality of the economy of the world. So I look at the whole map and try to relate them and to give some idea of what is happening because visualization, as you know, is very important and they give you the idea what is really happening. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think like with available data without much effort, you know, which one oh. In that case, then, you just read the index or read the information, do you read the read me? Because if you get those weather data, then they always give you a long list of the references and also read me files and just read them. And then they also an email address showing the people who is responsible for producing the like a tropical cyclone tracks and the SPCs. You can always ask them questions. Of course, I don't think there will be a limitation for you. I think you really can go there and get the data. If you're really confused, then just send me an email or ask anybody around, and people will be happy to wait, help you out. So in terms of specific expertise, then I don't think there's any being required. Oh, so you just like my students then, so you just let me go so easily, OK? No, it's the only <laughs> tough questions. I'm looking forward to challenges, so. Oh, Greg, I mean, oh, one thing I have to say that, that Greg used to teach this class, ATM 325, for almost like eight, nine years now, eight or nine years, and then he has been too busy. So my chair say, hey, wait a minute, Alex, you seem to be nothing to do, and <laughs> lots of free time. Why don't you teach the GIS for us? What can I say? He's my boss. Actually, I hire him. I hire him when I was a chair. I hire him, okay, I hire all the three faculty member in our department. We have only four faculty members, and I'm the most uh, perennial faculty there. So when I was a chair, I hired them 2005, 2004, and 2007. Another 2007 guy is a new chair, so I better keep my mouth shut. Yes, Greg? <laughs> I ask you many times the questions. Uh, no, I, I think that's got my hands full with RGIS already and chef files. It's really a lot of things we can do with the chef files. And in the very last class of the semester, I did give them a presentation of the introduction to RGIS Pro. So just give them a heads up. I said, this is the trend. This is the quite that's going to happen. You, you, you like it or not, that is what the ESRI is pushing so hard. But the thing I don't like RGIS Pro is that always you have to be online to log in, right? 
And that really not, I don't feel comfortable with doing that. I want to be alone, just leave me alone. I do whatever I do, <laughs> and then go to the PowerPoint, and then I'm happy with it. Why you have to ask my password long in? I just don't like that at all, so sorry about that. But yes, definitely, uh, they need to have understanding of what the future is going to be. And sorry for them, but not for me, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So along that vein, have you thought about using PGIS instead? Uh, after listening to, <laughs> to <laughs> Dr. Bernathy's pre presentation, I think, yeah, I, 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 I would do. Actually, um, for one of the students, explore the QGIS, and he liked it very much. And he told me that it's maybe we should go with a freebie. But the thing is that we already got a license, so there's no reason, incentive, instead of, in terms of the E, one of the E there, that's the, there's no incentive for us to go with the QGIS. I mean, we have the license. Everybody has a copy of their laptop. Everything you want to do, the installation, we do that for you. So and, That's a good point, <laughs> but uh, it's so unlucky for that guy, but uh, it has my sympathy, but what, I, what can I say? <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> well, I think they can learn both very quickly. I, I know one of the students doing the QGIS, he told me that it's so quickly. Once you know the RGIS, there's no problem to go into the QGIS and then learning very quickly too. So I think, yeah, it, exactly, it can go both ways. So I think the, the only thing I recognize that is, is motivation. If a student is willing to learn, they can learn a lot. That is a key. And as you all know, that the, how you learn the GIS. I watched your presentation. I said, what the heck? You learned all these things and, and did these wonderful things just because you are willing to learn. You explore, and then you learn it. And so that's how the people should learn, too. And that's how I learned, too. Very many sleepless nights <laughs> in Asheville, not in Seattle. <laughs> OK, I think my time is up, and thank you, guys. <laughs>